Naya, nice to meet you, Zena. I think we've met, we've met before. We've been yes. here before. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank yes. you for, for having me here. I've been trying to make it for a while. <laughs> okay, great. Welcome. Welcome. Topic wise for today, I wanted to discuss uh, fibromyalgia a little bit. I'm, I'm just here to learn and share as much as I can. All the topics are interesting to me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank great. you. You're welcome. Well, I'll dive in and feel free to interrupt me. I definitely don't mind that. Um, I, fibromyalgia is a, is a big and curious um, issue. So I, um, you know, I think I just touch on the surface of it in my knowledge base, but I think there's a lot of unknown about it. So I wrote up a little outline. Maybe I'll share that with you. Okay, sorry for all the red lining. That would be because my computer thinks I should be typing in Italian, not English. So, okay, I what I thought, I just put together some thoughts about fibromyalgia. I was trying to think about how to describe it and how to make it, give you some thoughts that might be useful in practice right away. So, uh, the, and the reason I picked this topic is because we do have and have had quite a few patients coming through our doors that have fibromyalgia. And it's one of those, the fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue tend to be lumped together. And often they do go a bit hand in hand. The symptoms could be really similar. And it could be really debilitating. But what's interesting about fibromyalgia is one of the primary complaints is muscle pain and aches. And so I think that's why a lot of them end up at our studio uh, because of the physical therapy there and just people who are fed up with being in pain who really want to get out of pain and end up coming in to try and find a way to get out of pain. It's a super difficult thing to treat and at different moments in their progression or of well getting well need different things. And so it's a very hard I think thing to really understand how, what do I do with someone who has fibromyalgia and how is that different from a regular client that might come in for strengthening or even a client who might come in, who's had a joint surgery or even has a back pain issue. So that was sort of the, the motive for coming up with this as a topic for today. So let me start with just trying to explain a little bit about fibromyalgia. So it is chronic, it's considered one of those chronic pain syndromes, it affects women more than men, and it's familial, uh, especially down the maternal line. So uh, I'm going to talk about a doctor named Melissa Congdon, just because I know her well, and she treats fibromyalgia now, but she got into treating fibromyalgia because she had fibromyalgia herself, and she, uh, her mother had it, she had it, and her daughter had it. So all three of them had it, uh, and her son not. Uh, so it was interesting that how it passes down in the familiar line and more towards the women. Men do get it, but I think it's more likely to pass down the uh, familial line to the women, maternal line. What, what is it about? So it usually happens after trauma, surgery, injury. It could also be uh, triggered after a psychological stress. So it's usually triggered, not usually, it's often triggered by something. And then it develops or shows up after that incident. It could be some theories, there's different theories about what's going on. To the general mainstream theory is that it's it's a result of the way that the brain and spinal cord are processing pain signals after repeated nerve stimulation. So what does that mean? Basically, uh, we, when we have a pain signal, it travels from the source of pain. So let's say, for example, I hurt my arm, my elbow. I have a signal, a pain signal that comes from my elbow to my spinal cord from my spinal cord gets transmitted to my brain where I then perceive that as pain. Sometimes with a serious injury or trauma, that pain cycle starts. And even when my elbow gets better, the pain, the pain cycle keeps going or that brain thinks that it's still sensing pain. And so we continue to perceive pain, even though 
we don't have it anymore. And that is actually how uh, people perceive. So you guys probably heard of the phantom limb syndrome. If somebody's had an amputation, sometimes they still feel pain in the limb that they no longer have. That's how they explain that as well. So they're thinking that in the case of fibromyalgia, that either there's an increased sensitization of the pain, the pain nerves, the nerves that process pain or think that they're feeling pain and that signals going to the brain. So we, even though we're not, maybe not injured anymore, we have that signal and we get stuck in this neurological loop somehow. So that's one idea. And I'll share the second idea in just a moment. Uh, the other other things that's really interesting about fibromyalgia is there's a lot of other associated syndromes. Irritable bowel syndrome, migraine headaches, chronic fatigue is really often a big thing as well. A lot of people have TMJ pain, um, and some people also have other psychological issues uh, such as anxiety or depression. And then if you keep reading the literature, some of them say that they develop anxiety and or depression because of the pain or the chronic nature of their being in pain, right? So those might be developing later or could potentially be a cause that leads them towards having the fibromyalgia in the first place. So what as a client, if a client has fibromyalgia, they're gonna complain of pain throughout the body. Uh, some people say often starting on the left side, and so people keep perceiving pain even when the pain is not there, um, even when they're maybe healed from the pain. And that's a reason why they think that, that fibromyalgia occurs, one reason, one theory. Other associated syndromes with fibromyalgia can be irritable bowel syndrome, migraine headaches, chronic fatigue, and TMJ. There's also psychological factors that could be at play as anxiety and depression. Um, and it's interesting because anxiety and depression are also recorded as a result of somebody who has fibromyalgia or who is in chronic pain, right? Uh, so I'm not sure if they may, they may have anxiety or depression be, and that may lead to fibromyalgia or they may develop anxiety and or depression as a result of being in chronic pain or having this syndrome uh, as well. Then uh, what the client, so what I wanted to do is give you a, an, an image here of a kind of a profile of a patient that what, what you might see when somebody walks into your clinic. So uh, I'll give you sort of my most classic uh, example. Usually uh, the people from the people I've seen, I would say on average, I end up with um, late 30, early 40 year old women. So young women in relatively good shape most of the time. Uh, she may have had a kid, maybe usually about two years old. That's pretty common. Um, and used to be hiking, doing yoga, doing a lot of things, and it starts with an area of pain in the body. A lot of times it's left-sided, and um, left-sided low back, left-sided hip. And so when she comes in, her goal, being a hardworking athlete and mom, is to just work it out and get better, right? She just wants to work hard and get better. But what starts to happen is the more she works hard, the worse she actually gets, and the more tired she gets, and the more pain she has. And so instead of doing a lot more exercise, she starts requesting more manual work. Say in, in the realm of physical therapy, I usually do a good divide of manual work and, and movement work. And so we start working more manually, but her symptoms continue to get worse, not better. Or maybe she gets relief for a short period of time, but then it comes right back as soon as she tries to move. And she sort of continues in this downhill spiral of pain and discomfort until she decides to take a break, right? She takes a big break, decides to back off entirely. So instead of working really, really hard, she tries to work less and less. And then working less and less through her body and really refining movements, which is what where Pilates instructors are great at, right? Really refining and fixing movement patterns. Uh, then she starts to get better, right? So all that to say that these are usually relatively young women who've had something happen in their life. So the other version is um, an older woman in her 50s, older, older than 30, <laughs> in her 50s who 
has been working really, really hard, constantly working really, really hard, not really taking any vacations, not really taking any breaks, uh, ends up all of a sudden being exhausted and not knowing why, has a hard time getting off the couch, can't, can't get herself to work, and then keeps getting sick with viruses that are coming around. Uh, this is way before COVID, right? So getting, getting the flu virus, getting it cold, the common cold over and over again, just getting more and more. And with every time she gets hit with a virus, she gets more, more ill and has more pain all over her body and less function. So uh, some people get so debilitated that they can't get up in the morning, they can't do household chores, they can't get themselves to work. So it can be really that bad. So what happens when they come into our studio for Pilates or even for physical therapy? What you'll see is that pain is a main complaint. It usually in one or two areas are going to be the main ones, but they might say my hip, my lower back, my right neck, my right shoulder, right? So there's usually that up and down pain if it's been a chronic condition for a time. Uh, and then when you start working with them, they want to work hard, a lot of them, because they just want to get better, but working too hard sets them back and makes them more tired, right? So they will also a lot of times complain of just dull pain, kind of aching through their body. They'll seem not very motivated sometimes because they're just uncomfortable under their skin. And they're going to complain of fatigue even after sleeping well. So a lot of one of the main complaints with people who have fibromyalgia is that they don't feel rested even after a good night of sleep. And then a lot of the other complaints are this fibromyalgia fog or brain fog that often comes along with it, uh, where they just have impairment uh, because of memory, because lack of concentration. I mean, things that you would really associate with lack of sleep and pain, right? That they just can't focus, they have a hard time concentrating. So then when you have your person coming into the studio, what's going to set them off or what, what's going to present in the clinic? Basically, they will probably have some pain while exercising, especially when, it increase, when there's an increase in intensity from what they've been doing before. And they may or may not have pain and fatigue after exercising and pain after the session even if they don't have pain or discomfort during the session. And, and that's the hardest thing I think about fibromyalgia is you could have a great session with somebody and they feel great in the session. You do some good work. You get their abs on, you get their glutes on, you get their lats and lower trapezius doing their work. So their shoulders aren't up by their ears anymore. She feels great. You feel great about the session. And then you get an email the next day. I was in so much pain. I couldn't even sleep. Uh, and, and it's not really, I don't even think what you did. It's just that it was such a jump in physical activity from maybe what she was doing before that her body couldn't handle it. And so that sort of triggers that traumatic pain nerve cycle again. And so it may not even be the exercises you did. It may have nothing to do with them. And, and so this is, it's just that there was increased exercise. Wait, so, um, the other complaints that they might have is fatigue that, that just doesn't allow them to get through their day. Or if they exercise in the morning, they can't make it past 2 p.m. without having to lie down and be done for the day. Um, a lot of times there's that complaint of neck and shoulder pain and tension that just never go away. Right? And they just it's always there and it just gets worse, a little bit worse and a little bit better. And then what I also see is that a lot of these patients are the patients who have a lot of anxiety around pain and have start to develop this sort of fear of anything new or new exercises. So any questions on that so far? Okay. So now, I'll sorry, you. go ahead. Zane. Yeah. Um, I have a question with regard to the, the similar, um, symptoms that are presented in fibromyalgia. I have a friend or client also that um, has MS and kind of presents in that same way. Is it a similar description or work around that same kind of idea with the pain and the fatigue or completely in a different realm? Um, well, MS is in a different realm because in that sense, 
the, she's actually not getting the nerve information to the muscles. Okay. So the pain and fatigue are coming in because she is actually working really, really hard to try and get her muscles to work. Okay. Got it. So it's um, now symptomatically, yes, they're going to both be fatigued. You're going to have to really be careful of how much work you do in any one session. So those things I think are really parallel. Yes. It, the, it. But the whole, the whole mechanism is quite different. Right. But, um, but you're right to think of it in, in, in terms of what, what you might do in the studio might not be that different or ways to manage might not be right. that different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, of course. So um, any other questions? That's a great question. Okay, so how I wanted to put together, I kind of give you an idea, and then I wanted to put together um, for you a kind of what, what are you supposed to do then? <laughs> and now I hope you're asking that question. So what am I supposed to do? Because that's the question that I ask myself. I'm like, okay, I've got all these factors. I really don't, none of us are on a mission to bother anybody. We're all on a mission to make people feel better. So what is it that I can do? So I tried to make a little list of what, what things would be great or not great or how to kind of handle the, situ the whole situation, not just, you know, uh, a muscle pain. So my recommendations would be first develop a baseline for the client. Find out what they usually do. What activities you usually do? What symptoms, um, what are your symptoms like on a daily basis? Um, and what, so if you put together what they actually do during their day and what their symptoms are like, you have something to build from, right? So you can, if you have no idea what they do and how they feel, you have nothing to start from and no marker for yourself to know if what you're doing is helping or harm or moving in the right direction anyway. So develop that baseline. Um, also just a little note here, many times what I've seen, and, and I'm not sure why this is other than women get more lax during their menstrual cycle, around the time of their menstrual cycle, well, their, during their menstrual cycle at the time of their menses, they sometimes have increased pain around that time of month. So that is something to track as well. If you, if you can, if they, if you ask that question, they may be able to say, oh, you know, now that I think about it, you're right. Once a month, I do feel worse. And it's, right before my period or right after my period. So that's a good thing to know ahead of time because they may be flaring up just because it is that time in their cycle versus the exercise you did, right? So just knowing that and keeping track of that would be helpful. And um, also you could, and I do this a lot. And I think some doctors who work with fibromyalgia do this, ask their clients to do this as well. But that's to keep an activity log and journal, tracking the activities they do in their lives, their daily activities, but then also tracking what exercise they did that day. And then also then tracking how they feel that night and the next morning. So at least you have a record of what's happening because you, and I'm sure you guys have had this happen. You do a nice little session with somebody, anybody, they feel good at the end. You feel really good about that session. You were very careful. And then they call you the next day and say, I was in so much pain after our session. And then I often ask, oh, how, what did you do the rest of your day? Well, you know, my husband and I were in the garden all afternoon planting and potting new, new plants. I was like, do you think that could have anything to do with the flare up? <laughs> because the exercises we did were really mild compared to gardening. You know, so it's really good to... If they have that journal, they can actually see that as well. I went to Pilates. I um, had to, I was taking care of four kids all afternoon was, because it was my turn with my family kid party. And, um, and then I was really sore the next day versus the day I just went to Pilates and I was fine. Right. So you can keep track of all these things if we have a log and they can see it as well. So what, what could be a good thing to do? Um, what I would recommend in the studio, you're going to start really slow, adding one or two trackable exercises to each session. So, and keep really clear notes of what you're doing so you can refer back and repeat and develop in a consistent manner. So this is one of the times 
where I'm, I'm a huge proponent of being creative, having fun, giving exciting new things. This is not that situation. This is the situation where I develop a set of exercises that I know are fine for my client. And when they come back in, I maybe add one or two or change one or two slightly. And that's it. We do repeat. We do it repeat and develop, repeat and develop. We don't do change all the extra. Okay, you did footwork on the reformer. Let's do footwork on the chair. Let's try it in standing. Nope. No, 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 no. <laughs> We're going to repeat and then just slowly develop through there so that we don't end up in a flare up that. And then if we do a lot of new, we can never tell what it was new that we did that actually causes that flare up or leads towards that flare up, right? If we have one or two things, it's usually pretty easy to figure out, okay, we know the rest of it was fine. We did these one or two new things. Um, let's cut one of them out and try with just the one. And then we can be sure. Also keep in mind that sometimes it's just one too many exercises. So some of these people you might want to start, depending on what they tell you their baseline is, you may want to start them with a half an hour session even, or a shortened session, or you do half an hour of movement and half an hour of just stretching, right? So that you have um, a, not too much intensity and a way and a place where you can build from, right? Without overdoing it on that first session. I also recommend uh, using light weights always. And then progressing to adding activity, not adding weight, right? So I would prefer adding an activity, then I would prefer to add heavier weight each time, right? So I think the goal should be more activity and keeping the weight light. Uh, try, and then the other thing I always try to do is, is try to match their functional limitations with exercises that you think could help them. So what does that mean? I'd like to ask them questions about what, what can you not do in your life right now that you want to do? What is it that you're limited in? And then once I know what that is, I can, if they say, I want to be able to walk and push my, the baby stroller for at least two or three blocks, right? So I want to think of exercises that are going to help move in that direction. Things that feel really functional towards that. So she needs to be able to push a stroller. She needs to be able to walk in good form with a little bit of resistance in front of her. So how could I do that? You know, what are the exercises that might lead, lead her directly on that path of strengthening? And then I would do those exercises. Okay, and then, um, so let me pause and see if you guys have any questions on any of that. That those are the main things I would recommend. Um, yeah. When, when you said um, increase activity over adding weight, you mean just add another exercise? Yeah, add or, another exercise, add a few more repetitions of the okay. ones you're doing rather than add more weight. So maybe you start out with only six repetitions in every position on footwork, and now you're building up to trying to get eight or 10 repetitions. Or maybe you add, add um, one other exercise to plan on the reformer this time rather than putting loading weights and footwork and then then they're done yeah okay so yeah yeah any um, other questions about that i have a more general question about something that you had mentioned earlier on when you were talking about the cause of fibromyalgia and you mm -hmm. had said that it's basically that there one of the causes could be that there was some trauma and that the pain signals coming from that area, like basically don't turn off. Mm -hmm. Is there any diagnostic, and this is more of a general question than specifically about fibromyalgia, but are there any diagnostic tools to determine whether or not it's actually the pain signal that's not properly turning off or that the healing hasn't actually occurred either properly or it hasn't completed healing? Because I have a lot of people that see me that are in chronic pain and sometimes it's hard to determine the cause, if, especially if it's widespread? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think if you ask a Western doctor, the response you're going to get is, I um, don't see anything on the MRI. I don't see anything on the x-ray. Therefore, they should not have pain anymore. And they shouldn't have pain and they do. And I don't know why. <laughs> that's usually, right? And they may have even done... Um, 
x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans sometimes, if it's like uh, having to do with internal organs, they've probably, you know, sometimes these poor people have been through like every test available right. and nothing's turning up. Um, and so sometimes people are saying maybe there's some cartilage damage in there that we can't see, or this is uh, quite typical in whiplash injuries that pain lasts a really long time and there's nothing that they can see that's causing the pain. Uh, so that's when, that's when you start getting into this, well, is it actually that everything has healed and this person's stuck in this pain cycle? Or is it that there's still something not, um, that's still something injured that we can't see? So if, if you, and if you look at percentage rates of accuracy for MRIs, for example, it's about 80% accuracy. So there is a window uh, of play of 20% or so. So sometimes they'll even go in and do uh, injections, if it's spinal or shoulder or hip, right, to see diagnostically even, to see if giving them a steroid injection will calm the pain from the pain description. Right. And if it does, then they know, okay, there's an inflammatory issue here that the cortisone or the steroid injection has taken away, if it doesn't help at all, and they're pretty darn sure that the symptoms and the original injury was in that area, then could it be that it's something else that's causing the pain, right? Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Because maybe my use of the term diagnostic tool wasn't really what I wanted to say. Yeah. Like for sure. like, Diagnostic tool, obviously, from a medical, you know, Western medicine standpoint, everything you said, MRIs, x-rays, the whole gamut, that makes sense. From a physical therapy standpoint, when you're watching people in movement versus like lying to take a MRI, is there anything that you know of as a physical therapist that helps us as a practitioner to determine if it's a movement pattern or a muscle imbalance or something else going on? Or is it just mm -hmm. <laughs> more reliant on client history? Uh, I think it's a combination of the two. Uh, I could probably, and I should say, I could probably find a problem with every single person's movement. Right. Uh, and so <laughs> that, that is, I'm sure a lot, I'm sure you guys can too, right? I, but, you know, you get to this point where, um, and I've referred a lot of people out who it's a confusing situation, right? I, but you know, if everything is aligned and you've been working with a person for strengthening, sometimes it's a weakness issue, right? Then they collapse on one side or they, right? But if you've worked with somebody for a period of time uh, and there isn't really any improvement or you keep getting stuck in the same cycle, I start to wonder, like something is not just lining up, right? It's just not quite right. Uh, and we, get, there's a lot more, um, I, I would say it's only more recently that people are talking about this pain cycle issue and the neurological patterns that we can get stuck in and how to soothe those cycles so that we get out of pain uh, and what the psychological aspects of that are and how you can even using just mental, sometimes it's mental work that needs to happen to change the cycle or shift the cycle. But if there's no swelling, if there's no limp, if there's no malalignment that's visible, if they are some days able to do something and some days able not to do something, for me, that's sort of really big red flags happening. Uh, and if the pain's moving all over the place uh, and sometimes it's worse on one side and then worse on the other side and the activities are pretty consistent across the board, then you really have to start to wonder you know, what is actually happening here? Is it, it can't be, if the pain comes and goes and changes sides, it can't be that it's like a, a joint injury or a cartilage injury on one area. It has to be something more systemic. And there are plenty of autoimmune issues that are also could be doing this Lyme disease, Lyme disease, there's lupus, there's a bunch of other things that could contribute to these things. Uh, and I think, but I think um, it, it's really hard for anybody to diagnose. So um, I think sending them out for extra testing, getting other people's opinions and getting all those Western tests done, but also 
maybe doing blood work and all of um, just sort of looking at the whole picture really helps understand. So that was a non-answer to your question, I know, but um, I think that's how I would approach it. No, I appreciate it. There are often are not simple answers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I, I'm going to share some more information with you in a minute. It's sort of another view of fibromyalgia. Um, and maybe that will also help clear, clear up or just give you more thought on it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let me just talk a little bit about what treatments are available for fibromyalgia. And then I'm going to share with you a whole nother path on or a whole nother thought on fibromyalgia. So treatment wise, there is no treatment that is 100% decided on as a cure for fibromyalgia. There are most doctors will provide pain medication or nerve medication such as Neurontin. They'll treat depression and anxiety. But again, remember we said that we don't know if the depression is a result of the fibromyalgia or if it is a cause of the fibromyalgia, right? So are we, we may just hear that's basically treating the symptoms. All these things treat the symptoms. And then on the flip side, um, and then, oh, also I should say that the longer that somebody has fibromyalgia, generally the more debilitating it is and the harder to treat it becomes. So there are, if we, if we step out of Western, direct Western medicine, there are, there is a treatment protocol for fibromyalgia. That's this guafenicin protocol. There's a doctor in Southern California named Dr. Saint Ahmad, um, who has a treatment protocol um, using guafenicin. Guafenicin is, um, breaks up mucus. Typically we see it in mucinex. It's an uh, you can buy it over the counter as well as just guafenicin without a prescription. Uh, he, uh, so he's developed this protocol um, and it is a treatment to help with fibromyalgia and actually to try and reverse fibromyalgia. So uh, let me explain a little bit about what he's found because it is different from what you'll see with other people. What he's found is that um, people who have fibromyalgia have muscle spasm and swollen places in their body, which they call nodules. And they're in a pattern. A hundred percent of people he's found have pat this pattern at their anterior thighs. So if you have these nodules in your left anterior thigh, um, you have fibromyalgia. So um, a lot of times people aren't even aware of those nodules. How do you palpate for them? You have to be trained. I actually worked with another doctor in the past, Dr. Melissa Congdon. She now treats people for fibromyalgia. And she was telling me, trying to show me how she palpates for the nodules. And she's like, she kept telling me I was going too deep. I go in, you know, by the time I'm already, it's the really superficial. And so you need a super light hand. You really know, have to know how to palpate for them. So I wouldn't even say that I know how to palpate well for them, but she's really trained to do it. And Dr. St. Ahmad is also trained to do it. They, and they create this mapping of the body. What, why they think these nodules occur um, is because they think that there's uh, some excess deposits of calcium and phosphate that attract water to the area in the body. So the body cannot process the phosphate uh, out and that is why fibromyalgia occurs. The kidneys are too sluggish getting that phosphate out. Um, so the idea is that this guafenicin protocol can reverse the, or lessen the amount of phosphate in the body. And so that's why it's a protocol that they feel like it works. There is, again, a lot of discussion around it. There was a study back in 1995 that showed that it is not effective. But then there are things um, in foods that can make guafenicin less effective. And so it has to be paired with the proper diet in order for the guafenicin to work to help reduce these nodules or to help reduce the amount of phosphates in the body. And then it starts to reverse the symptoms of fibromyalgia. So um, again, this is... Uh, not fully accepted in the Western world of medicine, but um, it is something. So, and Melissa Congdon is in Mill Valley 
in the Bay Area. So if you, um, and Dr. St. Amat has written a book about it. So if you know clients that have fibromyalgia and who have tried other treatments, I often just say, hey, there is another path. Maybe take a look. Um, maybe take a look at the book or do some research. Here's the website. And I just kind of send them that direction. If, if you know that they have fibromyalgia and they're having issues, some people would be interested. Some people are interested. Some people look at it and say, no, thank you. Not for me. But I, I just feel like it opens another door. Um, so anyway, if you're interested in knowing more about it, I recommend taking a look at what they have to say. I find all the other information, at least they have something to say and they have kind of a theory that's a little bit more, seems to be a little bit more tangible. And I've seen people really benefit from their treatment and protocol. So um, I think more study definitely needs to be done in the area of fibromyalgia. So, you know, the, but I just wanted to present you with both sort of sides, the very Western side and a, a little bit more alternative side and approach to treating it. You can also treat fibromyalgia with diet. There's a particular diets that really help um, with healing in the body and with healing from fibromyalgia in general. So even uh, some people won't opt to do this guifenesin protocol, but will opt to just try the diet that's recommended um, to help decrease the symptoms of fibromyalgia. And it's a primarily anti-inflammatory diet with a little slant towards, I think a little bit more paleo-ish diet, but I, I'm not well-versed. So I don't, I think looking it up would be the right way to go on that one. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I know about fibromyalgia and uh, my experience with it. Like I said, we do have quite a few people who come in with fibromyalgia and the ones that are more successful are the ones that I can really slow down, take it easy, get them on a Pro, a slowly progressing program and keep them consistent. And then I'm not the one, I'm not exploring for creativity with these clients, right? I'm just exploring for function and trying to get them to do similar to their daily functional activities in the, in the studio so that we're progressing their life, right? More than just an exercise protocol. So I'm going to throw it at you guys if you have any other comments or thoughts. I mean, that's actually really helpful uh, advice about going ahead and doing the same exercises each week, but progressing it slightly rather than trying to mix it up. Because I, as a private, I tend to try to mix it up. So it's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. And I think it's really good to, to tell them that that's what you're doing. Right. You know, we don't often, I, I don't know, I don't often tell my clients I'm mixing it up so I keep you interested because it's interesting. You know, I want you to be interested. I want you to have fun. I think, I think it would be, we don't say that to clients. That's what we do though, right? Um, but I think in this case, it would be worth talking to the client saying, look, normally we do a lot of variety and I try to share a lot of variety, but I don't think that's in your best interest. So our sessions might seem a little bit boring, but we'll slow, I want to slowly work with you to build up so that we don't upset your system on the way uh, and that we can be really sure that what we're doing or if so, if you do have a bit of a flare up it's a very small one so we haven't done all new and we can track it so it becomes trackable and then I, th I think people would actually appreciate that but I think it's the right time to to have a discussion and not just do the same thing over and over every week so that they think oh Pilates is pretty boring there's only like 10 exercises <laughs> you know yeah so exactly. <laughs> I thought there was a lot more to this Pilates, but I know yeah. all the 10 exercises, you know, so <laughs> thank you so yeah. much. You're very welcome.